Hi, my name is George Vranos. Thank you for purchasing the FACT 2 video program. Anytime we in law enforcement are defending ourselves against a physical attack, we must consider the attack as combat. Only the attacker himself knows his true intent. Only he knows if he is armed or not. Most real world attacks are direct, in a straight line, with full power and maximum speed. The attacker attempts to rapidly dominate his victim with non-stop offense until his victim is helpless. He has no reservation about committing the assault and is of a single mindset, attack. Without regard to the law, the attacker takes the advantage as he chooses his opponent, the place, and the starting time. Within the violent struggle, there is also an athletic component. All things being equal, the more capable athlete in a fight has the advantage. If both combatants are without fighting skills, the person with the best balance, coordination, leverage, and agility may take control of the fight. As a law enforcement officer or a civilian, we must defend ourselves with a reasonable amount of force, yet the force must still be effective enough to overcome the attack. If we don't fight back effectively, we may be injured or killed, but if we use too much force, we may be sued or charged with a crime. To be effective, we must fight fluidly without cognitive thought. The fact combative system integrates all these objectives in its sparring methods. We should only fight when there is no other option, using only enough force to repel the attack and stop when the threat has been eliminated. The fact system uses universal techniques, meaning the techniques are designed to be effective against all body types and sizes. There is no heavy lifting or throwing of heavier opponents. We do not have to punch up to taller opponents. The system is specifically designed for the criminal element and not the skilled fighter. Our attackers usually do not call a tie, sprawl, underhook, or set up submission techniques like cage fighters. The FACT system is basically a modified form of Western boxing and grappling for the street. Hand-to-hand -hand drills are the cornerstone of the FACT system. The FACT system is designed to be safe enough for its practitioners to spar at regular intervals for many years to come. These drills are also valuable training tools for most serious martial athletes. Please seek professional instruction during practice. Thank you. I hope you enjoy this video program. Okay, one of the first concepts that we try to stay with as an important fight doctrine in this combative system is we treat fists as if they're flames, meaning that we either want to be real far away so we don't get burnt, or we want to be real close so we don't get burnt. But we try never to be at the tips of the flames. If we do get caught at mid-range, which is very difficult to avoid in a real fight, we want to be moving, 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 or punching so we're breaking up the flames and we're confusing the fighter. So we're either far away from the fists or we a real close smothering thing. Want to go? <laughs> the next important concept that we want to follow in combatives is we want to avoid a struggle. So when we know a physical attack is imminent, we want to preempt that attack with a preemptive strike like you just saw here. You will see more of them at the end of the video. So the second important fight doctrine that we use in a combatives is to preempt the attack before he develops momentum, before he gets me on my heels, and before he gets me into a position or knocks me out. So we preempt an attack that's imminent or has already started off slow where he has not developed momentum. Wanna go? The next important concept that we want to try to keep in mind all the time when it comes to combatives, real world street fighting, is traction. In my opinion, traction is much more important than leg strength. Traction and position is more important than developing power from the legs. You just saw me set up a scenario where Andy and Paul were pushing against me. These athletes are much stronger than me, both of them individually. But what I did was they put them at a disadvantage. They were with bare feet and I was with a great pair of wrestling shoes. This is the same thing that happens, this is the same thing that happens in competition. Uh, a person can take advantage of his opponent just because he has a great pair of wrestling shoes or boxing shoes. Same thing we're on the street. 
If I'm a police officer, I don't want to get pushed into traffic. I don't want to get pushed over a guardrail or get pushed around a cell room because I had bad shoes on my feet. Buy a great pair of shoes, it can give you a winning advantage. Okay, now we're going to build the fighter from the ground up, starting with posture. A boxing posture, a fighting posture, is nothing more than a staggered stance that looks exactly like somebody raking the leaves. Just raking the leaves, he's up high on the balls of his feet, his heels are off the ground, and his hands go up in position. If you take a look at a fighter who's well balanced, like he is right here, you'll notice that he looks a lot like a spring with four coils. If you look, you'll see that he has a bend in his feet, his knees, his hips, and his hairline. So when he wants to bob under a punch, he bobs with all four coils of the spring. His hands are up above his chin. His right hand is on his face, just like he's talking on the phone, with his elbows relaxed and up against his ribs. His left hand can be close if he's in fighting, or it can be held six to eight inches away, and he's looking over that hand, just like he's looking over a wall. And that's a perfect boxing posture. His chin's dipped towards his shoulder. On his lead side, his right shoulder is back. He's ready to drop heavy right hands, and he's ready to fight off his attacker with his lead hand. That's a nice boxing posture. We don't have to ever worry about weight distribution because it's constantly changing during the fight. Okay, these two patterns are for work. are designed to keep me far away from my opponent, to keep me moving quickly at long range, so I can decide what tactic I'm going to use when I'm on to attack. So with a bicycle step, I'm far away, my hands can be down for balance, and then I'm ready to move it again for whatever tactic I want to use. Okay. When I shuffle step, I'm doing the same thing. It's a very fast step. I never cross my feet, and I move very fast, and again, stop, and I can attack my opponent. Again, moving in and closing the gap quickly. Okay. The next four patterns of footwork are very simple. We're going to follow the same principle with all four patterns of footwork. We have our boxing posture, and all we want to do is follow the same principle every time. Whichever direction we're going to go in, we're going to move the foot closest to that direction first. That widens our step and gives us stability, and then we follow with the other foot for mobility. So if I want to move forward, I widen my step, moving my foot to the direction that I want to travel, and I have mobility when I follow with my rear foot. So we go forward to widen that step, and then coming forward with our rear foot for mobility. If I want to move to my left, I simply widen my step, moving my left foot towards the direction I want to go, which is to the left, and that gives me my pattern of footwork moving to the left. So when I move to the right, it's the same principle. I want to widen my step for stability and then mobility. Stability and then mobility. When I move backwards, I want to do the exact same principle, but when we train, we don't want to go backwards more than one or two steps because it will give our attack momentum. We want to move back one or two steps and we want to change direction. So we widen that step, follow, widen that step, follow, change directions, widen that step, cut an angle, widen that step, cut an angle. Those four patterns of footwork are exactly the same. In the last pattern of footwork, making only seven patterns of footwork for this fighting system, it's just basic boxing footwork, is just a pivot step. So if he's inside and he's pushing and he's driving and I want out, all I have to do is just pivot off that foot and follow. The ball of my foot stays on the mat. It's just like squishing a bug. I push off my right foot and I punch and spin. And those are the seven patterns of footwork. It's very simple. There are only four basic punches in boxing, which makes it a punching system that's very simple to learn. The four basic punches are jab, cross, hook, and uppercut. Every other punch in boxing is simply a variation of those four punches, whether it be at a different level or be at a different angle and direction. So let's take a look at them individually. 
First is the jab. Again, back in our posture, hands are down, right hand is vertical like I'm talking on the phone, left hand is 68 inches in front of my eyes like I'm looking over a wall, and then we have the jab. My toe is pointing towards my opponent, the hairline is dipped, and I'm prepared for impact. So the first jab that I throw is just light over my toe, and I just throw it over my toe towards my opponent. It's light, it's fast, and it's in his eyes. The jab is designed to be busy, so it has to be light and fast, and it keeps my opponent's hands occupied so he can't punch back. So we always want to have a busy jab hand all the time. The whole time we want to leave him busy, waiting to drop the right cross. jab is light, it goes out fast, it comes back fast. That's the jab. The cross is waiting to be dropped. Now if you take a look at the way the right cross is thrown, it's not thrown, it's actually dropped. Try to imagine it's like a 2 by 4 against the wall. And it's actually going to be accelerated with my knee, which starts the rotation with my heel and my hip and my shoulder, and then the right cross is dropped. 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 Nice. Now I'll show you that on a hand pad. Okay, now let's take a look at the way the right cross is thrown. If the right cross is thrown properly, it has a tremendous amount of force. Like I said, the punch isn't thrown, it's dropped. The body accelerates all the way to the shoulder, and the last movement in the punch is actually the hand. I also want to accelerate forward with my shoulder and the point of my head. I don't want to throw a right cross and stay away from my opponent. It's very common that people want to throw the big punch, but they want to stay away from their opponent. And in turn, they have very little power. Once we decide that the opening is there, we commit ourselves with this cross, and we drop it for power. So again, it's the knee, accelerates the heel, it rotates over, pushing in the same direction as my cross, drops my hip, my shoulder forward, and it's dropped. That's the proper way to throw a heavy right cross. Okay, now let's take a look at the left hook. Hands are up. Again, we're going to start acceleration with the knee. The knee draws the heel forward. The heel is rotated just like a squishing a bug. It brings the hip and the shoulder forward. And we have an acceleration hip rotation into the hook. If you watch so closely, the right elbow comes up because I want the power of my punch behind my hand. Sometimes you see people throw a hook with the fist high and the elbow low. So the power is below the weapon and I lose my power. I want the power behind the fist. When we practice the left hook, we want to practice the left hook at a 90 degree angle with the elbow or less. We don't want to practice the hook at long range, reaching. We want to step in and throw the hook powerfully, which is at a 90 degree angle or less. When we deliver the hook, I want the hand to go through the target, like all punches. I want my elbow high at a 90 degree angle, and I want my chin behind my shoulder. And then I want to bring my hand underneath my eyes, like I'm looking over that wall again, so I'm protected at all times during the punch. So if I throw my hook as he throws his cross, my elbow and shoulder are protecting me against those punches and I catch it on the top of my head and I'm back again. The hook is thrown short and sharp. That's the left hook. Okay, now let's take a look at the uppercut. I'm just going to demonstrate the right uppercut for this portion of the video only. But the left uppercut is doing the exact same way. I'm going to generate my power again. The first movement is from my knee. This is what starts a lift of my heel. The lift of my heel accelerates my hip. My elbow, imagine it's almost attached to my hip, and it's being accelerated from the heel into my hip into my elbow, into my hand, into the pad, and the target is struck. 
I want to keep my right hand on my chin for as long as I can before I throw the punch, while I'm throwing the punch, and immediately when I finish the punch, I want the hand back for protection. So it's very short. It's only away from my, my face for a very short amount of time. And this is the uppercut. So it's a lift. That's the uppercut. Now I'll show you how we defend ourselves with just our hands with blocks and parries. There are only six movements. They're very simple. The first principle we want to follow when we're protecting ourselves with our hands blocking and parrying is to use only enough movement as it takes to avoid the punch and no more. We never want to overcompensate to move a hand out of the way because that will leave us out of position and leave us open for his follow-up punch. So if Paul throws a nice slow jab, you'll see me wait until the punch comes close to, my, to the target, which is my face, and then I will parry it only enough to make him miss. I want to stay within my balanced pocket between my feet. Again with the jab ball. <clears throat> only enough. I never want to reach or over parry. If he throws it and I go too fast, then he can hook after. Left hook. And I'm too close. If he throws the jab and I over parry, then again, I've taken my hand away from my face unnecessarily, and he can hook again with the left hook to my face. So when he throws the jab, I want to move it just enough. And I'm in my balanced pocket, so I can counter punch. What will make me a dangerous counter puncher is every time I use a defensive move against him, I stay close within my posture, and I try not to let him violate my balance. I try to stay within my balanced pocket so I can counter punch with, with maximum power. Balance and coordination gives me leverage, and I have power. If his punches make me move out of my balanced pocket, or if I reach too far, I'm going to be exposed. So again with the jab. The most dangerous time for him is when he throws a punch. He becomes exposed. Now the next hand block that I'm going to use is actually just a palm block. It's very simple. Throw the jab. I can just put my hand in front of me. This is what a lot of beginner boxes do because it's very simple. I have to time a parry, but it makes him more vulnerable because I've come closer to him and I put his jab on the outside. The block makes him less vulnerable, but it's easier for a boxer to do. But it's harder for me to counter. But it's very easy to do because I can see a trail and I can just put this in his way. Now, what happens when you face a good boxer is he's going to double and triple up with the jab. I'm going to show you this early on, even though these are just basic components. If he throws two jabs, I may be able to get the first one, but I'll probably never get the second one with a parry system. Throw two jabs. See how the second jab would have came right over the top? Because I couldn't get my hand back fast enough. So what we do with a double jab is I'm going to parry the first one, block the second. That simple, real slow. Parry, block. If he is the type of guy who's going to throw a triple jab, I'll probably not be able to catch it with the parry. I'm going to duck. So it's parry, block, duck. And that's how we deal with multiple jabs. That's what a good boxer should be doing, is doubling and tripling up with his jabs. Now let's take a look at the jab to the body. If Paul does a clean level change jab to the body, again, minimal movement. All I want to do is just pitch my elbow in, and I just want to minimize that. I don't really care too much if he hits me with a jab to the body. His jab should always be light to the face. It should be heavy to my body. If he throws a light jab to my body, after a couple times, if I realize that, I'm not going to care about a light jab to the body, and I'm going to ham him over the top of the cross. So the jab is light to the face, but he should be thrown heavy to my body to make me move and defend myself. Heavy. If he's not heavy, then I'm not blocking. If he throws a light, 
I'm just going to count it because he's not going to be able to hurt me. So why do I care? Now let's take a look at the blocking of the left hook. I'm already in position. I can probably box. I can probably block 30, 35 percent of all the punches just by having good posture. To be able to move into a position to block a punch is very simple. I'm almost there. So if he throws a left hook to my ear, all I'm doing is just ensuring that I'm completely covered and I'm taking the impact. I'm not worried about it. By the way, the best counter for a left hook is a left hook. So he throws it and all I do is prepare for the impact. Hand is up, hand is over my temple, and I take the impact. If I can just catch any of that hook, I'm protected. Now let's take a look at the right cross. If he throws the right cross, all I'm going to do is a box his half shell. Again, I'm halfway there. So if he throws it, all I'm doing is just put my hand up in the way like I'm trying to put a wristwatch in the way, like I'm trying to let him break my wristwatch. So he throws it, and all I'm doing is catching. So if you take a look at what we're doing here, right here at this angle, I'm basically watching Paul with my right eye. I don't care if I cover my left eye, but I can still see him. So he throws across, and I'm ready to count him. Throw it. When he throws the right cross to my body, I'm just pitching. And I'm pitching. Try to stay in my balance pocket. Again, it's just a pitch. Minimal movement with all these blocks to the body. Hook to the body. I'm just catching. Throw it again. If he throws a hook to the body, I want a level change and catch. Or catch and jam. Catch and jam. Catch and jam. His power is maximized where he's designed it to land. If I jam it, <laughs> I've minimized the power of his hook and I've closed the gap and I've counted the punch. The right uppercut or left hook is going to be blocked the exact same way on both sides. All I'm going to do is I'm going to pitch my elbow in and I'm going to take the impact. He's trying to take my jaw off. Right uppercut. <laughs> and again. <laughs> again, I'm looking at my target. I'm staying in my balance pocket and I'm just catching. That's simple. Those are your basic hand blocks and parries. Now I'm going to show you the three specific head movements. Only three. That makes it simple. Only three specific head movements to avoid and evade punches. This is so simple. You watch the fighters before in their posture. You watch how they stayed within their balanced pocket. That's very important when it comes to head movement. This is where a lot of fighters violate their balance is during head movement. You'll see so many fighters trying to evade a punch and going off balance, leaving them no opportunity to counter. Going over their toes, going past their knees, drawing the chin over the center of their body. That's a big mistake. Again, in all your training, you want to try to stay within that balanced pocket, especially with head movement. So we're only going to use three here. We're going to use a slip, a slip, and a bob. Later on during the drills, we'll show you how to practice ducking. People love ducking. It's a little more complex. Everyone loves the fancy stuff, but this is the stuff that we can make work real early in our barking training. So all we're doing when I'm looking at my opponent and he throws his punches, is all I'm going to do is I'm going to slip my head down on a 45 degree angle right towards the toe of that side, but I'm not going past that knee. I don't want to violate that balanced pocket. It's only enough to make him miss, just like in our hand blocks. So when he throws that punch, it's all I want to do is come between his fist and his elbow. I don't want to go to the side because I stayed right where he wants me. I want to go in so I'm close to his body. When I go to the outside where his strong hand is, I want to slip, but I want to keep my right hand up in case he throws a jab cross, I'm protected. On the outside, I slip. I can always stop the cross with a block. If I slip to the inside where his right cross is, I can become vulnerable if I don't put my hand up. Let's take a look at that. He throws the jab slowly. I slip to the outside. I just got closer to my opponent. He just became vulnerable for the moment. I didn't slip to the outside and stay here. I slipped in. 
because I want to go in. To slip to the inside, I'm going to bring a blocking hand with it. Again. So now, if he draws across, I'm protecting. The bob is straight down. When I bob under a punch, I always want to come up with a punch. If I bob under a punch, and I come up without a punch, he's just going to wait with that right cross. So I bob under, and I come up, and he catches me. But if I bob under, and I put a jab in his eyes, he has to defend himself, and he can't counter right away. So again, there's only three movements. It's slip to the outside, slip to the inside, and bob under. Those are the three movements, the basic three movements that we use. Later on in the video, I'll show you how to duck punches. Let me just point out some important tips about boxing and training before we go on to the grappling. When you're practicing that footwork, we talked about setting the foot, moving the hand, we want to move the hand immediately after that foot makes contact with the floor. As soon as my foot touches the floor, the hand accelerates. We don't want to move, cut an angle, let our fighter adjust, and then throw. We want to cut an angle and fire right away. So anytime we set that foot and move to cut an angle, we want to fire immediately as our foot hits the floor. That's the way you want to shadow box, that's the way you want to hit a bag, and that's the way you want to box in a ring. The next important concept that we should all be working on all the time in the gym is high, low, high concepts when we punch. You see a lot of people throwing alternating punches, left, right, left, all day long in these gyms. If I have a person in front of me that wants to protect himself against punches and I throw alternating left, right, left punches, as soon as he blocks the first punch, it's highly probable he's going to block the next two or three or four or 17. So if I go left, right, left, his hands are there in front of his eyes. He might catch them all. That was actually beautiful. So what I want to do is I want to throw high, low, high. This creates confusion. Now the fighter has to adjust to all my level changes, and he doesn't know what they are. It's a real slow ball. I'm going to go jab, cross, hook. So if I go high, low, high, it creates a tremendous amount of confusion, and it's a lot more probable that I'm going to land one of those punches with a lot of leverage while he tries to follow me with level changes up and down. That's why it's so important that we use the body like a coil, because it's going to be fast. Another important concept is, again, I told you before, when I have a very busy lead hand, a busy left hand occupies the right cross. That's one of the punches I'm really afraid to get knocked out with. If I'm constantly throwing a busy left hand, jab, hooks, the fighter's right hand is occupied, my hands are in his eyes, and he can't throw that cross. And then I gain my confidence and I come in. So when you're practicing shadow boxing, when you're practicing on the bag, let's educate that lead left hand so we can take control of this fighter before he throws the heavy shots. The next important concept that we want to practice, whether we're shadow boxing, hitting the bag, or sparring or doing drill work, is making sure we take our defense in and we take our defense out. If I unload a combination on Paul and I go inside, and then I step back out, Paul's going to follow me back. He's going to knock my head off my shoulders. So when I go inside, I want to take my defense with me in and take my defense out. And then I'm covered and ready to go. Now, coming out in a straight line is not the optimum way to defend yourself. That was just for a demonstration, although we'll be doing that all day long. You're much better off coming out at an angle. But each and every time you throw a combination, even if it's the same combination, you want to come out a different door than you've gone in every single time to keep your opponent confused. So if we go high, low, low, out. Again. Or on his heels. That's defense. When you push a fighter on his heels, he has no power to generate with his hands. I defended myself because he's trying to throw punches on his way back. That's just a general concept. Defense in, defense out. You'll see a lot of this in our drill work, and I think you're going to like it.
The next concept that we want to follow in combatives, even though we're using Western boxing, is we want to bully our fighter. A good boxer will actually try to bully his fighter also, see how much he can get away with in the ring. When I'm in here and I'm fighting this guy, I want to trap his hands, I want to bump him or jab over the top. I want to push him. I want to punch him and spin him. And I want to abuse him going backwards. All the time when we're punching. I want this guy on his heels. I want to try to regain his balance. I want him confused. I want him tired. We want to abuse our fighter while we're punching him using a little bit of grappling within our boxing. Another important concept is focusing real hard on shortening up the speed of your combination. It's more important to have a fast combination than a fast punch. You see a lot of these long range fighters that may or may not belong at long range for whatever reason. But to have a fast punch <coughs> is nice. <coughs> but throwing one punch at a time with somebody who already has some skills is gonna be very difficult to hit somebody because I'm throwing them at long range and speed isn't enough against skilled fighters. What's real important is fast combinations. The distance between the three punches being short is more important than a fast punch. I'd rather see a fast combination, especially short. The short combinations. The, the time between the first punch and the last punch should be as short as possible when you're training. The next important tip that you need to follow is you want to start off with your lead hand and end up with your lead hand in most of your combinations until you're more advanced. If I throw combinations in odd numbers starting with the lead hand, one, two, three, then every time I finish my combination, I ended up bladed, hands up, and back into my posture. It's a comfort zone. If I throw combinations in odd numbers ending with my right hand, I end up like this. Tell me what you're saying. You see a fighter committed forward with a right cross, stuck there, trying to come back. And it takes too much time. If I come back with the left hand in his eyes, then he's had to block that last punch. And while he's blocking it, I'm back into a zone of safety, which is my posture that I believe in so much. So I don't care if you throw three punch combinations, 11 punch combinations in the beginning of your training, try to throw in odd numbers until you're more advanced. Now let's talk about inside punching a little bit. And this is interesting. Um, I would advise all my fighters when they fight inside to fight as closely as comfortable, as close as possible while it's still comfortable and they can generate maximum power. Physiologically, we're all different. I've seen some fighters that can fight you right here four inches away. And some fighters can't fight inside unless they have 15 inches. We are who we are. But when you practice, try to find out how close you can get and still generate power. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, if I'm real close, he has very little reaction time or none at all because I'm too close. So if we're in close and I'm throwing these short punches, that's a comfort zone for me. He has a big problem. And now Paul wants to find room. He might need 15 inches before he can punch inside with me. So what Paul's left to do is push me and spin out and try to get back to the outside again. And I can win that inside game if I train to, close, to punch close and he can't. So when you train inside punches, you want to punch as close as possible so the other fighter can't deal with it and he's constantly trying to find room while you're punching and he's not.
Now we're going to move into takedowns and ground patrols. This is a combative system. This is not submission wrestling. This is designed specifically for the street. When we say the word street, we mean two things essentially. That means any environment where we can get attacked as a police officer or even as a civilian. Any environment means a bar room, a wet street, a slope, or close quarters in a hallway. The street also means open class. Any size person, any weight. We have no weight divisions, obviously. We can be people of all different sizes and shapes, making many of the things that we practice in the gym very difficult to do on the street. The system has to be very simple in the respect that we try not to use too many fine motor skills or complex movements. Most of them are very simple steps. Almost every time we move into a takedown, each takedown starts just like every other takedown with only a couple of exceptions. Therefore, every time we move into our first move to practice a takedown, we're actually practicing the first step in about six other takedowns. So it takes very little training time. We're always looking to have commonality into our system. The same thing happens when we hit the ground. We're gonna be doing the same ground system over and over again, no matter where we end up in relationship to our opponent. I think you're going to enjoy this. Okay, the first part of the four-point blitz is actually called the cross-step four-point blitz. This is the most dangerous blitz that we have. It's very powerful. This is one of the old times we actually cross our feet in the system. So if he was attacking me, just stay there. If he was attacking me, I might meet him by crossing my foot, gaining my traction, and then lurching forward with my knee, the point of my elbow, which is my main focus, my hairline, hardest part of my skull, and the palm of my hand all at the same time. So I'm coming at him with four weapons at the same time. And at the same time, I'm also defending myself from all sides while I'm shooting down in. So put your hands towards me quite a bit. So I've covered myself from kicks, elbows, punches, anything that he might have. Just brace yourself for a second, quick. So we walk forward, it's a cross-step blitz, and it's all four points of my body driving into him. This is a center mass hit. I'm trying to create blunt force trauma. In law enforcement, we try the best we can to get way below the sternum so we don't strike the hot area. Obviously, this can be lethal. This is a lot like a spear in football. This is more like football than it is martial arts. And it protects us from a charging technique. It's something that's, the charging technique is just not addressed that often in many of the martial arts systems. And a person running at you is, is just very difficult to deal with, um, to try to see him, see his punches while he's running at me. Some people swing and punch at the same time. This gives me an opportunity to close that gap and stun him as quick as I can. So that was the four point blitz with a cross step. Cross step, four point blitz. Everything I had, meeting this guy in the middle when he came towards me. Street fighting is very emotional, they're running, they're charging all the time. The three point blitz is, is just a variation where I don't have enough time. He comes towards me and is close, and all I'm doing is just, again, hitting him with my elbow. I'll do it slow. Elbow, head, and hand. This is very fast, I don't have to pick up my knee. And all it is is just a... And of course, everything that we do should be tactical, it should be disguised. So if he's coming towards me, I want to look like I don't want to be in the fight just before I drive that elbow to him. And that's the three-point blitz. Every technique that we do is basically a modification of wrestling. You're gonna see a lot of familiarity in what we do. This is nothing more than what we call a blitz knee pick. Again, we're up here, we're fighting. I want to close the gap quick, smell the flames. I want to hit him with my shoulder, the point of my head, and then I'm just going to move into a modified wrestling knee pick, which is just hit, and I just hit his knee. I'm not lifting. There is no lifting in the system. I'm pushing him up on that last leg, and I'm actually just driving him up onto it. I'm not going to pick it up. So if we're fighting, I just come in. I just pick. And then again, for simplicity, with all the different things a good wrestler can do from here, we're only going to step behind him. And then we move into the ground or strike our opponent. So all it is is we're fighting, we're stepping in, hitting him with our head and our shoulder. Again, just like walking down the street, we just step behind his leg, drive, and then finish out with Maybe we do our ground control. Okay, this next technique 
is called the Fox's Trap and Slap. Again, just another modification of a wrestling technique. In our system, because we're dealing with the pavement in different environments, we can't drive our knee to the ground for singles and doubles. So what we do is we use his body as a hip to, to protect that knee. You see this all the time in our system. You'll see it later on in our drills. When I step in, I want to step between his feet, at least in front of his lead foot. So when my knee goes to the pavement, it draws my body into him, prevents my knee, and knocks him back, gets him on his heels, so that my takedown has more integrity. So when I step, I hit, it knocks him back. One of the things that we want to do when we train in this is just to practice breaking his center of gravity without even doing the takedown. So a lot of us try to stay up. We'll practice just stepping in and bump. And if you notice, my knee does not hit the pavement. I hit his body first before I go to the ground to protect my knee. Break the center of gravity. And then, of course, it's very easy to keep him going down to the ground because I've broken his center of gravity. Trap. Slap. Get him to his leg over. And we move into four corners into batters. Controlling his hands, preventing him from reaching for weapons. Most of them are going to be near his waist and in his pockets. And now we're going to move to a pinning system. No fine motor skills. Back over again, and we control. And then at this point, I can see his hands. If he happened to have been armed, I could have removed the weapon, and I could actually frisk him from the air before I move into my other position. Before we go on to our other takedowns, let me show you why we go to the four corner and we try to avoid the mount initially. First of all, the mount is a position that many people can be comfortable with. Anybody with a DVD player and TV, TV and a rug can buy a videotape and learn how to reverse a mount. Again, we're talking about an open class match where we get people with very, very long legs. And even if we have some ground skills, a tall guy can do a big back hatch and put him way out of position because I'm a small guy and I'm in a big weight division. But if I'm in a four corner position, down here, this is more confusing for him. And he probably won't know how to do a reversal if we're talking about a street confrontation. Again, we're back into the mount. <clears throat> Another problem that we deal with all the time, you know, we're taught the mount on a lot of instructional videos where we're high and we can punch and he can't reach us. Again, that's not always true. We have to deal with long fingers, fingers in our eyes. He can grab our clothes, pull us down with our clothes. Also, things can happen, but he's facing me just like he was standing up. This isn't very confusing for people. It's extreme position disadvantage, but it's not very confusing. It's not a place I want to be. I don't want to get bit. I don't want him control me, pull my clothes, and pull me down. So we, we try to go to four corner and use that system because it's very confusing. I'm now going to explain the importance of the four corner pin in combatives. But before I do that, I have to show you what we mean by a wrestler's grip because you're going to hear me refer to that and you will not be able to see my hands underneath my assistant. The wrestler's grip is nothing more than my fingers coming over the base of my thumb, just starting to touch my wrist with the other hand doing the exact same thing. Nothing more than four fingers coming over the base of the thumb on both sides. And it looks kind of like an S. Not in the center of the hand. The real strength is down here at the base of the thumb. Now, if you take a look at my two assistants, they're going to try to pull me apart. Now, I'm not the strongest guy around. I don't even lift weights. But the grip itself has a lot of integrity. So if these guys want to try to pull away, it's all they got. They can go crazy. They want to go ahead, guys. Really pull. I'm just going to rely on the grip. I'm not using any strength in my arms. Just once I close my fingers together, I'm going to pull catch really dry. Just really try to pull this thing. This grip has a tremendous amount of integrity. We're always going to the proven, proven techniques that we get from grappling. This is a technique that all grapplers use on the mat. It's something that we need to use in combatives too. Over and over again, you're going to see that our optimum position within the system is the four corner pin. Whether we come from the side, the top, 
even when we're kind of almost in the mount position or a side position, we're going to keep going to the four corner, at least initially upon controlling somebody on the ground. We need to constantly avoid being near his fingers and his teeth. We're trying to avoid from being bitten. We're trying to avoid from having his fingers in our eyes. And again, this is very simple. This is not a comprehensive submission grappling tape. This is for combatives, so it's very easy for anybody to remember with a very small amount of training time. No matter where I am, I'm going to try to do the same thing all the time. I'm going to try to take both my elbows, and I'm going to try to scrape down alongside of his ribcage and get my elbows into his armpits. Wherever I come from, I'm going to do this. Now, all I want to do is, is control him with a stall point. I want to stall before I try to control him or manipulate him. I may grab his clothes, I may grab his arms, take that wrestler's grip, I may adjust. Now his arms are completely controlled back here, I'll try to pull the arms up. Again, I'm using that wrestler's grip. I'll never break that. If I come in here and now he tries to back hatch, I'll make that wrestler's grip again, like I just showed you, again. I will try to base out, control him while he's going crazy for the first few seconds. I can adjust again, going back behind his head, but we're going to stay in full corner initially to control him. We want to be able to lay down on the side of his jaw so he doesn't bite. If he does, we want to twist. That's how we prevent biting is we twist. And now we want to move to our position. We're always going to move around this direction if we can in the beginning of our training. So the elbow comes down. Again, no fine motor skills. We could be fighting in the snow. It's not uncommon. We could have injured our fingers during the fight while we were striking with this individual. Or we could have poor fine motor skills because of high emotional stress. So again, we're just going to take our elbows. I'm going to take my elbow. I'm going to turn it around. I may even go all the way up to my knee and control his arm. I may put it behind my back when I move. But I basically pinch it. I call both hands to control my step. I pinch that arm. I'm going to take a simple step just to sit up underneath. I'm going to move over to his side when we get Follow over again. This way. So I he saw me trap his arm. He saw me trap this arm. My elbow was down to the ground, pinched his arm. I sat out. I controlled him, I controlled his arm. Again, we're not doing any fancy submissions in the system. It's not what this is. Now I'm going to kick over, I'm going to control his arms. God forbid if he was armed, but at least I controlled his arms. Now I'm in a position right away where he can't bite with me. Where he can't bite, he can't scratch. Again, I can reach a stall pool with my wrestles grip, keep my elbows down and be okay. And then I'm in here for just a modified street mount. I can grab his shoulder or his clothes. I can check his hands. I can reach down, see if he is armed. I can just move over. Again, controlling him, control his hand. Keep him pinched. Again, I can search him, frisk him, and I can control him, at least for the time being. The next takedown, again, is just like all the others. It starts with lead leg forward, just like everything we do in our system. Again, this is the last long step shoot in our system. If you notice, all those takedowns so far are driving with the lead leg, driving with the lead leg, driving with the lead leg, they're all very similar. So every time I practice one of these techniques, I'm practicing the first stage of every other technique, which makes it very simple to learn. This is called the boxer's low single. Again, it's a modification of wrestling. We do it different than a wrestler. All I'm going to do during the fight, you can throw a jab if you want, is I make a level change, and I drive my knee forward, and this time I protect my knee, and I brace with both hands hitting the pavement. As the knee comes down, I hit with the side blade of my hand here, this hand is based out, and I've cupped his ankle. And that is to be done in one move. <sighs> just like this. Paul, if you can just abide there for a moment, you'll see that I'm completely braced in four corners. So if Paul, you try to move me around a little bit, you'll see that I'm based out, and I have a position of control, and I'm going to get ready to complete this takedown. So again, we go up. So level change, hands protect my knee, and I'm locked in. Now, a good wrestler will actually shoot from out here. He can't go off balance at all with the level of talent that he's going to be facing all the time. Again, this is combatives and this is for the street. So when I hit this guy, my attack is almost immediate and I use my shoulder. It's a bigger target, it's easier for me to do. It's almost like football in a way. And then I hit, grab the ankle, flag, and I pick up his knee, hold on to his ankle. I'm going to use his ankle to pull me in. I'm going to take one long step, 
drive into his belly, and then back and forth, come again. And then when he's in, come over, and control. Now we're into four corner again. Paul, try to shake it. And break. Again, back to four corner again. Okay, now we're going to move to very close quarters. We're going to move to inside fighting here, where we've actually tied up. And, uh, and now we still want to take a guy down with a universal technique. Again, this technique is, is going to work on anybody of any size. All of our techniques, except for the, the punch by and the wrestler's grip, will work on anybody that's got a pair of feet on the ground. Same thing with these two inside trips. Again, this is very simple. Uh, we try to stay away from sweeps because of the way feet grip the street and sneakers. So there's, there's none of that. We don't have to do any of that. This is very simple. No matter how we end up, whether it be arms tied up or around each other's waist or grabbing each other's clothes, we'll be able to do these inside trips. Even if we're pulling hair or clothes, whatever it takes out there in a combative situation in the street. And once again, we're going to use our lead leg again for simplicity. The same thing over and over again, which makes a system so simple to learn. We'll be inside, and then all I'm going to do is just articulate my lead leg. I'm going to drive it behind, step, and just drive behind this leg. And then again, moving into our four corner position again. If we're moving around, it becomes dynamic and on the outside. I can just take my lead leg again and go behind his leg. And then we're down to the ground again, using our lead leg over and over again in the system. So, so the leg is articulate. Just like a boxer's jab is articulate, our lead leg is articulate. Again, for simplicity, so, so all of our takedowns have so much commonality. You can even do it for that leg on the outside too. If we end up in a position where he steps forward, these guys are trained, they won't be off balance like that. The way we can practice this real simple is two guys in the club can just figure four with their own hands. They can grab on. When you first learn this, you can do this very carefully in this way, where we can control each other down to the mat. And then all we're going to do is I just step in and I control Paul as he goes down. We first have to learn this. Make sure, we have to make sure we're fully warmed up when we do things like this because our knees are really hitting the mat at an angle. So once we're loose, we're fine. So all we do is we step, and this is how we step. And we'll be able to do it with all different kinds of grips that we saw when we're grappling. We can do it when we're punching with the gloves, whatever we do. And the same thing with the outside. We're back again. But the figure four grip makes it very simple for everybody in the beginning because they want to have a visual when they first start. We want to be able to see each other's feet when we first start to learn this. Eventually, we'll be doing it from inside, from be a hug, and any other way on the inside when we're fighting. Two inside leg trips, or three from the real leg if he steps forward. And again, it's very simple with an articulated left leg, leg, just like an articulated left arm, like a boxer does. Very simple. Now I'm going to show you two takedowns that are not universal in the respect that they're not designed for people of all sizes, but they have so much integrity that we have to show them to you. If I'm fighting someone with my own size on the street and we've come in close, I'll show you a takedown again that's very simple, it's designed specifically for a combative system that anybody can do. We're going to use a wrestler's grip, we're going to use my radial bone, I'm going to use my shoulder to control his head, and my temple against his temple and I'm going to hold his head during this fight. So let's say we're inside, we'll be out right there. And now you see where his forehead is? I'm going to find my way to get that in there. I'm going to take my radial bone and lead hand. I'm going to go into that wrestler's grip, which is, has so much leverage. And then I'm going to crush his neck. And I'm going to push his forehead backwards. It's kind of a two-way action. The radial bone is actually cutting in on an angle up towards the center of his brain. And I'm pushing his forehead back. The amount of pressure that I'm putting on his neck muscles is what's going to make him break down in front of me and he's going to break down from this. So again, it doesn't take any athletic talent to just crush that neck, bring the rest of the triple head up. And then I'm just going to turn him around, and then he's in a Hawaiian choke. And all I'm doing is I'm using that wrestler's grip, I'm bringing this elbow towards the floor, towards the back of his head, and I'm crushing him until he goes to sleep. Wrestler's grip, and crush. Wrestler's grip, and crush. Now I'm going to show you 
uh, basically a modified version of what wrestlers call a punch by. We're in close again. Again, it's not a universal technique. This is for someone close to our own size. We're in fighting. I'm just going to use a regular boxer's overhook where I've got his hand and we're fighting here. Again, nothing complicated in the system. I don't have to do any back stepping, which takes basically hundreds of repetitions to get good at it. Good at it. No Greco Roman or judo. All I'm going to do here is I'm just going to, with a strong grip on his arm, really strong, I'm going to throw his spine out of alignment, which weakens his upper body. And I'm just going to throw a boxer's punch. It's called a punch by. I'm going to throw a punch. And now I've misaligned his spine. I've started to weaken his upper body. Again, no backstepping, nothing fancy. All I'm going to do is just put my foot there and lay all my weight on his head and sit down to the ground. And now we're just into a basic head and arm pin that you see in, in wrestling or in old school jujitsu. It's not some place you like to stay for a long period of time with a, a skillful submission wrestler because they'll go out the back door and go bridge and roll. But for our purposes, we're going into combatives. Once again, the same system over and over again. And we've got control of his arm. I just take it, I throw it down. Before we go to the four corner pin, we have an option here. If that hand had a weapon, if that hand had a weapon, I threw it down there, I could hyperextend his elbow by driving my foot away from our bodies, at the same time pushing my knee to the mat. Okay? And just drive in, and it would look something like this. That knee would go down, and that would hyperextend his elbow. Do not use elbow locks for pain compliance. As people on the street will not respond to the pain, they'll be injured first. Pain compliance techniques like wrist locks are better because we're attacking the radial nerve and the ulnar nerve and they'll react to that. But there'll be injury before significant pain and we'll end up with an injured prisoner. So yes, we could cripple the arm. Submission wrestlers do all sorts of things from here. And if you're already doing that on the mat, those are the things you might want to use. But again, for combatives, for simplicity, all we're going to do is we're going to throw the arm down. We're going to trap that arm. I'm going to grab his head. I'm going to spin, elbows in between his armpits again, trapping, even if his arms are down, trap, drive, turn, spin, and back into our controls again. And there we are, into a position of control. Okay, now, again, from the head and arm pin on the ground, Get strong with your wrist here. Again, we're going to be struggling with people here. All I'm going to do is I'm going to knee his arm, and I'm going to push these two knuckles down for control. Get strong. We have a wrist lock. We start to have a different situation already when I put that wrist lock in. <coughs> now what I'm going to do is once I break his wrist position, I take my baby finger and I hook his baby finger. Can you zoom in on that? I grab his baby finger, just like you see in my first video. Grab that finger for control. Then, I push down on his two knuckles with the heel of my hand. And I start to gain control. Now, I lock his elbow out, turn over, face out, and I push these two knuckles towards his face. His elbow's locked, and I drive towards his face. Now I reach under his chin, Walk him into handcuffing. Back in again. See that from a different angle. We're into a head knot pin. Again, struggle. Hit the elbow. Grab the finger. Look for pain compliance if you have to. Control the elbow. Turn over. Lock the elbow. You can control the head. I push these two knuckles forward, reach underneath, grab his chin, and back into handcuffing again. That's called the crowd pleasing handcuffing technique. Every time you do that, you're going to hear something from the crowd. Okay, now let's go back to our three positions of control and let's go into some submissions now. 
Nick, if you could, just lay down right here on the floor. We'll go right back into full corner pin. We'll move right back into our position. So again, elbows scraping into his ribs, drawing his arms back, positioning control first. Um, you never want to be in a hurry to go to a submission. You want to make sure you have full control of this person first. Pinch the arm, sit out, draw, keeping it tight, and then I'm keeping all my weight in between both his elbows. Right now this is very uncomfortable for Nick. I'm actually placing weight on this side of his elbow down and this side of his elbow down. I don't want to be anywhere else before I clamp down with that wrestle whip. So I'm clamped down here with my ribs, then I'm in my wrestle whip, and the first thing I'm doing with that wrestle whip, if you could just swivel here, with that wrestle whip is I'm drawing down, I'm picking his head up off the floor. If Nick was the type of person that could back at you for whatever reason, back at you with Nick, I'd be in trouble not taking his head off the floor. So I need to take his head off the floor. Again, that wrestle whip is very powerful. And I'm drawing by pinching my legs, Drawing up on his body. Now I want to move into a submission. And I want to put him to sleep or get him to submit. So while I'm still creating pressure in here between his elbows, I'm looking for that position. Take your time. Look at where he is. Move in. Controlling your arm. Hold your arm. Draw in. Grab a wrestle grip first, jump over to the side, ear to ear, and then control his arm, and then slowly move in, grabbing your elbow. You can do this like you see in submission, where you can just draw your elbow and you plow, drawing his bicep into his neck, and squeezing until the struggle starts. Now, I'm pushing his bicep and his upper arm into this part of his artery, and I'm drawing my bicep and shoulder into the other part of his arm. My ear is to his ear, my elbow is to my elbow. And what I don't want to do, a lot of people do in learned submissions is they push up on the jaw. It, you feel immediate resistance when you push up on the jaw, so people push hard, and a lot of times you're not getting the strangle, you're just getting a lot of resistance. People are satisfied with that, so they continue to push. But the pressure is actually down. We want to try to push down until we get submission. Now let's see what it looks like from the other side, from a different angle. My elbow is to the floor. My ear, my neck is pushing his arm, my ear is to his ear. If I were to jump, if I'm using wrestle scoop again initially because it's quick. I can just jump over or step over. Now it's just like a plow. I want to drive in low along this plane. I don't want to drive down. I don't want to drive over here. I want to drive down low in this direction. So my elbow is here. Again, there's nothing wrong with doing this type of technique. We're using big people, big necks, big arms. I just want to use something that's a little simple. I'm just going to grab my elbow. My knee is initially in his waist, in his hip here to control him. And I stop my strangle, and then I can move over, and I can base out and draw it in. And bring him to submission or unconsciousness. Again, here's my bottom hand, here's my top hand. My bicep is working that side of his neck, closing his artery, and I'm pushing his arm into the other side of his neck, closing the arteries. In gently putting him to sleep, listening to him, monitoring his breathing, feeling his resistance, and knowing what he's going through while I'm doing it. Now let's take a look at that Hawaiian choke, and let's see what happens after we have a failure. Again, the Hawaiian choke is that wrestler's grip from the wrestler's crush takedown. Actually, what we're trying to do is, is we're taking that crush immediately upon him, going to the ground. We crush quick, before he can resist. We actually keep his head cupped in my arm, and then we turn this elbow down towards the ground. This one comes up, and it's actually not easy to escape, especially when the choke has begun so quickly. And it can be successful. We can get a choke without using a real lot of pressure on most people. 
But we could have a problem if we were to have somebody with a very thick neck, a lot of power up here, a wrestler type like Nick. So we have the Hawaiian choke, and we start to work it, but he explodes up. I take my hands, I go with the wrestler's grip, I maintain contact, and I come up, and I grab in with a fist. Go back down, Nick. Do the flow. So now I'm like just yeah. The fist is behind the knee, and now I have the strength to stop him. Otherwise, I never would have been able to do that. If I had stopped Nick in this method, and Nick just used his strength against me, it would have been the ball game for me. So I need to use my arms as, as basically pry tools to stop him. So I've stepped up into behind my knee right away. Again, we try not to use strength in a combative system. There's no strength. Now, Nick, bring him on forward. The other hand is behind his back with my knuckles between his shoulder blades, up on a 45 degree angles, just like the wedge in my first video. Again, this hand is over, under the knee. My palm is flat against my body, or I can grab my clothes. My fist is in, and now he struggles. And I can just sit back. Set my hooks. We don't set hooks often in combatives because we have boots on. Police officers, military corrections. But here, I'm just bringing them in. And I'm crossing my feet. And then, as the struggle begins, I'm going to let his power throw my arm into the rear naked. And then we set the strike. The elbow is down below his chin. Now I'm as deep as possible. My palm is over my biceps. And into the back of his head, I take a deep breath as I squeeze, and that's our submission. Okay, let's just walk through this one more time, the ground bench. I'm using my fist as a brace. There's nothing the matter with grabbing his clothes, if it's there. I want my hand up on a 45 degree angle. Again, there's nothing the matter with me grabbing his clothes, if it's there. It's only gonna make it stronger if you can think of that. We don't do that a lot in practice because we try not to use fine motor skills. But if we have it, we can do that. Grabbing his clothes. And again, you saw me taking it back into a rear mount. If Nick exploded, it would be the same thing. Nick back at you. I would just follow back and finish again. Just different things you could do in case you want to cuff somebody, in case there's a second officer on scene, you need to be first. By now you should have watched the boxing instructional and the takedowns into ground control. That's a very important part of our training, to come into a club every single day and work on the perfect mechanics of our technique. But in order to execute that type of technique, 
as good as it is against a live opponent under a real world attack, we're going to need to practice lots of fast drills to build reflexive triggers. And we're going to have to design dynamic simulation in our training, which is just the way that we spar. And we put it all together, we can move reflexively with the techniques that you saw in the beginning of this video. So I hope you like the drills as much as we do. This is the cornerstone of our combative system. And you'll probably watch 30 plus drills throughout this video. Every day the fighters come into a gym, they need to practice plenty of repetitions of their takedowns, whatever they are. And the takedowns have to be done from many different directions. With the opponent stepping back and away, with his opponent circling him both different directions. But if you notice, the fighters take their time, make sure that their penetration step is clean each and every time. And the fighters will come into a club and practice a minimum of 50, maybe 100 a day. And as you can see, they go real fast. But in order for the fighter to become proficient, they have to do hundreds and hundreds of these over a course of four or five months. Just like when they come into a club and they shadow box and they practice hundreds of punches, they practice hundreds of entries too. The first set of drills are designed to help the fighter develop his balance, his lateral movement, his level changes, and his ability to maintain a fighting distance so he can enter and he can exit away from the other fighter anytime he wishes. This first drill is called the toe stomp drill. And this is one of the drills that's designed for the fighters to practice their in and out movement, maintaining fighting distance. And you notice they're practicing, practicing that accelerating lead foot, which is used both in boxing and it's also used for the penetration step to take each other down. This is also a great way for the fighters to condition physically. These fighters are in great shape. These guys could go for four or five minutes without a problem. But the drill is not for conditioning alone. It's actually to develop that fast footwork that you're seeing right here so they can confuse their opponent. And they try to step on each other's foot. And it's actually done like a contest where they're trying to win. So there is a competitive element in this drill. The name of this drill is called corner hops. This is another drill designed to keep the fighters on balance while they're exhausted because as you can see they're trying to overload one of their legs and these fighters will not stop until one of the legs is completely overloaded and exhausted. If you watch people fight, a lot of times they're driving off one leg at a time, not two. This is one of the ways they do it. They try to go from corner to corner and they try to knock each other off balance during the drill. This next drill is called the stop and fire drill. So you see the fighters, they're staying away from the flames, they're circling their opponent, and then they suddenly stop and they fire. Again, he's practicing the two, two first parts of our footwork, which is the bicycle step and the shuffle step, and then he fires. This is called the cross your heart boxing drill. Basically, this is a way for a fighter to practice his punches while he has a moving person in front of him. Rather than just hit the punching bag, he can start to work his shots. He's on his toes, and his target is always moving. And the fighter that's taking the punches is also starting to get used to impact in the beginning of his training as the shot goes through his body. Impact is a very important part of self-defense training. Later on, they'll be doing medicine ball and other drills like that to condition their body. This is just a shoot drill that the guys do. They can move rapidly underneath each other's center of gravity, make a deep penetration step, getting some plyometric training in, it's very physical. So when they attack on the street with a leg shot, they move very quickly. And when they get tired, they can finish with a simple little takedown if they want. This is just called an angle and close drill. The fighters are practicing these real quick angles and they're closing the gap for whatever takedown they want to do. 
But again, they build in reflexive triggers. So when someone punches or pushes, they move automatically at an angle of advantage or they take the shot. And that's an angle and close drill. Good guys. This is called a body jab belly spin drill. And now you see a fighter practicing his jab and his footwork. You see the other fighter practicing his angles, changing angles all the time, trying to deflect that jab, staying on his toes. He's also getting a little bit of impact training, which is what we do in the beginning of our development. And the fighters are again working constantly on fighting distance and reacting to an attack. And circle ball, circle him. Good. And smother him. Beautiful. Okay, this is called the helicopter jab drill. Again, it's very important that the fighter can move in and out quickly. He's trying to time the glove going by. As you can see, he's moving in, he's moving out. And if a fighter has a good accelerated step, like you see here with Paul, and his opponent doesn't, then his opponent's not gonna be able to follow Paul back, or he might not be able to react to Paul stepping in with that accelerated step with his lead foot there. And of course, he's practicing his jab nonstop. Using his peripheral vision, which is really important to develop the subconscious and develop triggers. His form is always there, his right hand is up. See his lead toe pointed right towards his opponent. It's good boxing form. He's moving in and out. This gets very physical also. And now his coach is going to speed that up and he's going to start to create challenge. And hopefully we can get some failure in here so it becomes real difficult. And this is where the development happens, when he becomes challenged. And there it is, right there. Let's get that thing moving. This is called the trap and spin drill. As the fighters close the distance on each other, you can see the fighter on the right. Paul is gonna to try to throw his fighter off balance as he spins him to the left with just a twist of his elbow. It almost looks like a left hook. As you can see, he's captured his right hand, which we call a trap. Closes quickly, spins him off. Then you can see he can spin him to the right with a bump on the fighter's left arm and move the other direction also. Now he's moving to the right. And of course, he would capitalize with counter punching or he would shoot in after he got his fighter off balance. Again, you see a lot of footwork in these first few drills here. And you see a lot of closing and a lot of timing and condition. This is called the hook and pivot drill. You can see the fighter start deep on the inside. So when Paul wants to come out, he comes out with a busy pair of hands. So what he does is he occupies the other fighter's hands and he can come out safely. Lots of hooks. The other fighter would have been defending. Then he comes out with a fast jab. Again, they start in tight. Lean right up against each other. Right in tight. Lean right in head to head. And then pivot out. And there it is. Rather than just step away without punching. This is called a close and counter drill. What we don't want is when a fighter is getting punched to stay in the exact same place and let his opponent finish his four punches. As you can see, Paul is trying to throw four punches and as soon as the combination begins, Sean is gonna close the gap and then counter punch right away. He moves right out of the tip of the flames and he smothers him and counters with his own punches. We don't want the fighters to stay where the punches are. It's very common that a boxer will see the four punches coming, he'll just brace up and stay. Sean's not doing that. Sean's not gonna wait for him to finish those punches where they were designed to land. This is called the peekaboo duck drill. Paul's gonna throw very slow, predictable punches one at a time. He's gonna throw a big wide left hook, and then he's gonna throw the big right hook. I know exactly when they're coming, but this is gonna give me an opportunity to time his punch and actually move into my counter punch, coming out an angle. And this is what I was talking about when I was talking about ducking. 
People love to duck. We don't really need it that often, and we don't often see punches thrown this wide, but it's an important drill to develop this reflexive skill. And then, of course, we move into our combatives. This is just a, a simple baton swing drill. All I'm doing is I'm moving the baton right where his neck is. I'm making sure that he's got to move his head at least four or five inches. And if you watch, Paul is using four coils of the spring in his posture. You see him using his feet, his knees, you see him using his waist, and you see him dropping his hairline down. And this is just the beginning of bobbing. And he's starting to do it. And Paul can do whatever level he wants to practice. But basically, we're putting lots of repetitions in here. So anytime someone strikes at his head, he will reflexively drop down, and he won't get struck, or he'll get caught on top of the head. And then, of course, as the fighters get more advanced, you'll see them start to practice their counter punches, because they know they have to come up with a punch. We talked about that before. If Paul were to come up with a punch, then it would be easy for the fighter to counter him. But every time Paul comes up, he's going to start coming up with a punch in my face. And there it is, repetition after repetition, dropping the coil. And then I'll move faster and faster so we have a failure rate. And so he's challenged. This is brutal on the legs when you start getting to about 30 or 35 repetitions. And as I start to shorten the stroke here, he's really working. It's great for the legs. It'll get him a fast as he tries to keep up, and he's doing fantastic. And that's exactly what I want the fighter to do. And Paul, if you get counsel with those short little bars. That is beautiful. It's exactly what we're looking for. It's a very important drill for the fighters. Okay, this is called the mirror slip drill. You can see the fighter on my left is acting as the coach. Basically what he's doing is he's gonna move at random patterns with his two slips, one to the outside, one to the inside, and he's gonna bob. Both fighters should be using their body as a coil, just like a spring. And what's gonna happen is he's gonna let the other fighter get some good repetitions in here, make sure his balance is perfect. That's what he's trying to work on. And then pretty soon, the coach is going to try to challenge him. He wants to create struggle. So the fighter is challenged. It's going to get more difficult and actually virtually impossible to keep up. But either way, you're going to get a lot of fast movements here. And pretty soon, you're going to have some very fast slips. And they'll be fast enough to actually slip a punch in a very short amount of time. And this is called the mirror slip drill. Again, it's difficult. There's a lot of bouncing with the legs here. And now he's going to start to pick up the pace more and more. So there's more and more fa failure. And there's more and more challenge, just like all the drills. It becomes much more difficult. As long as this fighter stays in his balanced pocket and he practices perfect slips with his hands up, he's getting some really good training here, both of them are. It's a very important drill to practice that head movement. Okay, this is a rope ducking drill. Everybody gets together and they start to practice their bobs here. If you notice, they only duck far enough to make that thing miss. And Kelly's really get that thing swinging fast. They'll go one direction, which simulates a punch from that side. <laughs> That's great. And then after a while, she'll stop, and we'll change directions so she can duck from the other side. Go ahead, move. And here it comes again from the other side. Keep it high, Kelly, and away they go. This is really cruising here. Now after a while, I'll challenge the fighters to actually duck under and attack their opponents. So now you'll see them go towards the glove as they move around the group. Keep it high, Kelly, keep moving, guys. Good work. So now the fighter is simulating an attack, actually ducking and attacking under a punch. That's counter punching. In and under. Great job. And they keep going and moving. You can see it's not a perfect drill, it's at all different levels. And again, they duck, and you even see some slipping in there as they attack their fighter. This is called a buzzsaw drill. So you can see Paul swinging the glove towards the face of the, face of the fighter. The fighter is going to rock on his hips first. He's going to slip and slide side to side. He tries to come inside the glove, just like you would in a real fight. He steps back. He accelerates in. Eyes open wide, staying on his toes. This isn't just for punches. This is for grappling. Someone came in high with his hands. He might have shot in for a leg shot like you just saw. He might have sprawled away from a fighter that attacked him. 
But now you can see the fighter's doing level changes. He's slipping, he's going in, he's going out. And now we want a failure rate. So now you're gonna see Paul, the coach, start to pick it up a little bit. Because we want the fighter to be challenged, we want him to struggle. That's what's gonna happen. And they're gonna keep moving regardless. But he wants to be challenged. Now we're going to work on a hand-to-hand -hand defense drill and put a little live action in it. One of the things we want to do in the beginning is make sure the fighter feels real comfortable practicing his defense so he can stay in that balanced pocket that we talked about. If I start these guys boxing too early, the way they've all been trained to punch with leverage, then what will happen is they'll do everything they can to avoid the punch, including going out of their balanced pocket. So what we do is we practice this little drill called the half glove drill. If you look, Paul's fingers are only halfway into his drill. His fist is stopped right here in his fist, right here halfway through his glove. Now what Paul's going to do is he's going to throw that glove right through to his eyes like he would in a competitive boxing match. He's going to try to drive right through. Sean doesn't have to worry about it because it's only a half glove. Now these guys have been around a little while. They're a little beyond this drill, but this is how we start. And what I advise the fighter to do is actually let the glove hit him in the eyes first because we want to practice minimum movement in all of our drills, in all of our defensive drills. So when he strikes at Paul, I want Paul to move just enough to let the glove slip off his head. And in the beginning, he'll actually let the glove touch his eyes. And he'll come inside, he'll actually move in, so he's actually moved within his range so he can counter punch with his outside slip, his bob, and his inside slip. And that's what you'll see. First, he'll stay stationary, you'll be able to watch how it starts, then they'll pick it up, and then they'll move around for us with footwork, and they'll move in and out, and you'll see the fighter in a nice, relaxed atmosphere where we can actually play with this, and he can experiment with his defensive head movement. And go, guys. So you see what Sean's doing is working on minimal movement. He's playing with it, he's toying with it, he's testing it, he's trying it, he's experimenting. He's having a good time with it. And with this drill, Nothing is safe, this is pretty safe. And this is where the guy could learn. He's taking a look at where he is, where he lands, when he slips under a punch. He's thinking about where he could counter. And he's building a reflexive defensive mechanism with his head movement. Again, we have to do thousands of repetitions for it to become reflexive. Head movement is so important. And first, we work on perfect mechanics, which you see Sean doing. Sean's flowing, having fun with it. He's sliding, thinking about what he could counter punch with. And then what's gonna happen is Paul's gonna act as his coach and Paul's gonna start to pick up the pace. And you're gonna see some struggle here, because we want struggle. And that's where all those exercises like the mirror slips come in for the fast, fast slips. And this is very difficult to do because Sean's trying to do it without using his parries or his blocks. He's trying to use just his head movement. It's not easy because Paul's showing very short jabs and it's tough. Just remember the three C's of boxing. Conditioning, coachability, and concentration. You see it's a fantastic concentration here. It's very difficult to do. and Sean Counter. Beautiful. And that's the half glove drill. That's how we start. Now we're gonna practice some quick release drills with the hand, just basic hand speed when his target presents itself. So you'll see the fight is ready to go, and as soon as that target moves forward, he's gonna attack it. Just as if someone brought their head forward, or they moved down too deep or too close, he had to fight him. And here we go. Now in the gym, you could do this behind a heavy bag. One guy gets behind a heavy bag, the other guy gets on the other side, and he presents this without notice. He doesn't know when it's coming out. In the beginning, he may be able to predict where it's going to go, but as they go on, he's going to get, 
going to make it more and more difficult. He's going to create some challenge here. And he's going to get faster and faster. And pretty soon, that pad's going to come back faster and faster. And if he doesn't release it quick, he's not going to catch it. And obviously, the fighter has fantastic focus. He's been able to stay with it the whole time. Finally, we get a little bit of a challenge. This is the struggle that we're looking for. This is what makes it difficult. And this is a great way to condition the guy's jab. Fast, crisp, and sharp. Beautiful. Thanks, guys. OK, now we're going to practice a lot more counter punching drills and a lot more defense. But before we do that, we want the fighter himself to be confident in his blocks before he spends hours and hours of repetitions practicing these particular drills. So one of the things the fighters will do is, is he will actually ask the other fighter to throw his punches increasingly more powerful in small increments, 10% from 10, 20, 30, 40%. You'll see him block the punch, you'll see him ask him to increase it, he'll stand behind, he'll brace, and then pretty soon he'll have confidence in his blocks, and then he'll be able to practice with confidence as he continues to train throughout the year. So, go ahead, guys. Now here it is, you have a very small guy standing in front of a big slugger, and he's testing these punches. He's taking some very powerful shots here, and he knows he can hide behind them. You guys, try the left hook. And these are the two most important blocks that they're going to do. And as you can see, Jay is testing himself. He wants to know he can believe in what he's doing before he practices hundreds of repetitions. There's a lot of leverage in that hook. And now Jay knows he can stay behind it. That's good. That's great. OK, now the fighter is going to work on the basic blocking of combinations. What we try to do here in combatters is throw real short combinations, maybe two or three at a time, and then that's it. We don't try to have long combinations here because these guys are going to shoot or they're going to close the gap really quick here in combatives. But here we go. If you could, Mike, just throw a jab left hook to the head quick. We'll start working with that one right there. And these guys are just going to start to throw in cadence and start to work. Andy's going to just stay relaxed in his balance pocket, staying focused. We're going to work that drill. And he'll just pick it up a little faster. And he develops his confidence. You know, he can stay behind these shots. If you take a look, a left hook is a lot like something you see a three th street th fighter throwing a punch. And the block that he's doing will work just as well. Now, if you could, Mike, just throw a jab, cross hook, all high. And he'll just progressively move faster and faster as Andy tries to perfect his blocks. Good. Now, if you could, Mike, throw a jab high, cross right to his body. Jab high, cross the body. Same combination follow up with a hook to his body outside his ribs. Let him rip. And good, good guys. And whatever combinations they want to work on, they'll communicate to each other and they'll work them over and over again until their movements are reflexive and they can protect themselves without cognitive thought. And that's how to do it, that's how to work, that's how to train. And now you just take that to the next stage. Which is, which is basically the fighters will communicate, they'll call out a combination, and the other fighter will try to block using just his hands without his head movement, but they'll use footwork. If you want, Sean, just start off with a jab hook, just like the other two guys just did. Now jab cross hook. Now jab cross double hook. Jab double hook. Now jab high, cross to the body, hook to the head. High, low, high. Good. Again. Again, straight right, right to the body. 
This is a very important combination for us. We're always trying to work the body in combative. Good guys, thanks. And now the fighters are practicing the blocks against uppercuts. All Andy's doing is pitching in his elbow, catching those shots as Mike's trying to rip his jaw off, and he's just believing in his blocks. As you can see, they're all so similar and so simple. And you look at the way his hands are, from his hands all the way to his elbows, how much he can cover. Good guys, thanks. Okay, now we're going to practice some counter punching skills. But before we do that, before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about how we create a knockout in boxing. It was said to me a long time ago by a great boxing coach, the difference between a big puncher and a knockout puncher is four inches. And what he meant by that was that a big puncher might hit you all day long high on the eyebrows, but a, but a good fighter that knows how to fight will stay tucked and will point his heel line at me and I can hit him all day long with these freight train right hands. But the great fighter, the knockout puncher, will always try to expose that chin. In combatives, we're always going for the body because it's an easy target. And people have no idea how to block the body. And we can incapacitate for long, very long periods of time. Anytime you throw a strike towards the eyes, even an untrained person can reflexively put his hands up and make you miss and creating a problem because you hit his hands. So in combatives, we're always trying to hit him with, where his eyes aren't. Even when you move towards the body in the street, people sometimes will reflexively move their hands up to the eyes because they're protecting something that's so vulnerable and useful to them, which is their eyes. And the body is very easy to hit. It's very hard to move. And once again, we generally do not go for the head for several reasons. Number one, we're fighting bigger guys. And you know, honestly, there's a lot of cement heads out there. You can break your hands on these guys. You're talking about communicable disease with blood. You're injured, it's a small target, and again, people reflexively will block their eyes, and they can stop all of your punch or some of your punch. So in combatives, we're always trying to break the body for long periods of incapacitation. So if you take a look at his eyebrows to his chin, that's the four inches that I'm talking about. That's how we spin the head. Basically how we knock somebody out is we try to get a rapid spinning of his skull. So the inside of his brain catches up to that spin and we knock him out. It's those angles that spin his head that gets him knocked out. The different things that boxers do to get the head spinning all the time. Get the chin to constantly get that quick spin. That's how we achieve an easy knockout in boxing. That's why we're always cutting angles. And again, in that combative system, we're using the jab for the eyes all the time to blind him. But if we throw to the head at all, it's always to the chin, trying to get him to spin his head. In this next combination, you're going to see them practice. I want to see these guys actually try to catch the chin over the jab. Many times a guy will throw a jab that's too slow, and we can just, what we do, call cross the T. Rather than parry the jab, we can just wait for him to throw the jab, and I can just throw my jab over the top of his forearm. All I do is I graze his forearm, I take a look at his collarbone, and I just go over the collarbone, and I'll catch his chin. In boxing, we don't want the boxer to try to hit a chin, try to hit the eyes. All he does is throw over the collarbone, actually shoots towards his throat, and that's how we get the chin. You're not going to be able to punch a good boxer in the throat, even if we throw at the th throat, because he's always tucked. So all we're doing is going over the collarbones all day long, and that's how we catch the chin. So in this drill, when he throws a lazy jab, we're just crossing the T. This is something that happens late in the round. This happens when someone's exhausted or they don't have a lot of skill. They throw the lazy jab and we just go over the top. If he has a fast jab, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to catch it. If he throws a lazy jab, bang, we just come over the top and it's a counter punch. So many boxers are conditioned to parry, block, and slip a jab, and they lose the opportunity to counter with a heavy right hand. And that's what these guys need to work on. If you could, just show them a nice easy drill like that. And that's it. All they're doing is just, just choreographing the small move. Now when these guys are sharp, if Sean was sharp throwing a real fast jab, Paul might not be doing this. But if, but if Sean decides to throw a lazy jab, that's when Sean's going to make the decision to go for the knockout right over the top. And all he's doing is just shoot right over that collarbone, right into his throat, and he'll catch that chin. And then if it could really slow, just show the spin of the head. And that's the action that causes the knockout. And that's what we're looking for in that particular counterpunching drill. Thanks, guys. I know I talk about the balance pocket all day long. 
I talk about the balance pocket for a couple different reasons. Number one, all our leverage and our ability to counter punch comes from being in the balance pocket so we can always counter punch and shoot. Once we're out of the balance pocket, we can't attack well, we're off balance. But there's something else very important about the balance pocket that you need to know. I can absor absorb a lot of shock if I'm in my balance pocket. I can absorb a tremendous amount of punishment here, sitting with my hands high up over my gloves and my head tilted towards my opponent. But if someone takes me out of my balance pocket and hits me when I'm out of my balance pocket, it takes very little to create a knockout to catch my chin when I'm reaching and I'm not able to absorb shock through my shoulders and my hands. So you're going to see Paul do what we call an anchor punch. Instead of parrying like he expects, Paul's going to actually catch the jab hand and he's going to actually catch it in flight and he's going to anchor that foot to the ground and take his chin out of the balance pocket. I've seen this done many times in just a small, short right cross and cause the guy to flop around on the ground. This is very important, not just the technique, but the concept. Watch how it's done. See how he catches the forearm and he draws him down and he exposes the chin. He actually pulls it. He's doing that purpose. And that's an anchor punch. Very dangerous counter punch. Very good. This is called a counter punch cadence drill. This is training the fighters to react immediately to a punch that's coming directly at them. So they're timing it and they're going directly underneath the punch. Straight punches are coming at the fighter and the fighter wants to throw those punches exactly while this guy's firing and on the way out when he's most vulnerable. And again, we're just building reflexive triggers. So when someone throws a shot at him, he can just drop a shot right to his body. And we're just drilling this into his subconscious so it becomes reflexive. And we'll try to get a little failure rate, pick it up a little bit, Mike. Make it difficult, very difficult on the legs. And good. Okay, this is now, this is just a boxing closing drill. You can use this when you're boxing. You can use this in combatives also. What's going to happen is Andy's going to throw a sharp jab to Mike's face. And when Mike defends at the exact same time, Andy's just going to explode and close the gap for whatever he wants to do on the inside, whether it be punch or take him into control. And go, guys. And he uses a, a, a boxer's half shell, just like you would against a right cross. Again, using the same movements over and over again. And if they want, they can move around a little bit. And that's how you safely close the gap, occupying your fighter's hands, and then you just attack at the same time. And you're in. Right behind your jab, right in his eyes. And the elbow's in, he's tucked and he's covered. And that's just a simple way to close in on an opponent. And you're in for anything you want with an accelerated step. Thanks, guys. OK, this is called a freeze drill. What we want to do is we want one fighter throwing some heavy punches, and we want this guy blocking his punches while staying in his balanced pocket. But we want to be able to test that balanced pocket under some pressure, under some heavy punches. So Mike's going to throw, for now, just a left-right-left -left combination. You can do this with any kind of punch. And the coach is going to actually yell freeze in the middle of that combination. And I want to see where he ends up. And if he's in his balance pocket and see if he can counter punch under those adverse conditions. Start off light and then just pick it up and I'll yell freeze. And both fighters are gonna you stop when I yell freeze. Freeze! Andy, can you counter? Go guys. Freeze! Can you counter? Go again. Can you counter? Andy was in perfect balance every single time. And these guys can do this with all kinds of combinations. But this is a fantastic drill if you have somebody that's going off balance all the time in their sparring or in their heavy drill work. This is the drill that you can test your fighter under adverse conditions with heavy punches like they were throwing. And he'll stay in his pocket. And then he can counter any way he wants because he's balanced. Good job. Now you're going to watch the fighter actually counter a left hook with a left hook the best counter for left hook is left hook, and they do it with this combination. Good guys. 
Good enough. Good work. Okay, in this next drill, I'm going to limit this fighter to nothing but defensive skills. I am not going to allow him to defend himself with punches. All he can do is block, parry, move, and circle. Um, I'm going to create a lot of adversity. This guy's going to throw random punches at any pattern. I don't know what they're going to be, neither does he. And uh, we want to try to create some adversity out here because defense is so important to combatives. We need to be able to make these big guys miss because, of course, we're open class. There's going to be some big guys swinging out here. So we're going to work on all these defensive skills. And, of course, he would use these skills to make a big guy miss, and he would take him down with the legs like you saw before in the video. Go ahead, guys. Could Jay finish with a nice slow leg shot? Nice and light. And that's the way these guys would finish their opponents. They wouldn't stay up there that long. Thanks, guys. Okay, this is called the angle, bump, and punch drill. This is actually not a knife defense drill. This is not what this is for. This is for empty hand fighting. There's actually some components of knife fighting in here, but that's not what this is. It's much more comprehensive than that. This is to get the fighter to angle sharply, very quickly, and get him on his toes. Most of the other drills, the guys are walking around with a lot of stability. But the big difference between a street fighter and a train fighter is angles. Street fighters charge, and this is just a drill to get the uh, train fighter to angle quick, real quick, sharp angles. So he can take a position of control, turn the fight around when he angles and he follows him through. And of course, in a real fight, he would angle and punch, or he would angle and he would take control. Good guys. This is called a drop and close drill. What these guys are practicing, besides lateral movement, is they're practic practicing fast level changes, and they drop it in real quick to grab the back of the knee. It's not easy to do, it's easy to go off balance. But what happens is the fighters can close the gap real quick. They're not trying to take each other down, but it will happen during the drill. But again, it's a lot of fighting distance and quick entries. And again, it helps them both with the striking and the grappling. And they go back and forth and try to catch each other's knee a little bit. And if they can go in quick enough, then they could easily do a shoot and finish like that. Good guys. Okay, this is called the back heel trip drill. Go ahead, guys. And what these guys are doing is they're finally practicing the push pull, push pull concept. And what they're going to do is practice those two heel trips that you saw before. And they have like a little contest where they move each other around. And they can use the lead leg for an inside heel, just like you just saw right there. And the outside heel, and they go back and forth, push each other around, circling, trying to time the body leverage or creating an opportunity or staying on balance again but it's these contest drills that are really, really important for their development. And again, these are very simple. Again, they're modified. When, they, when we do wrestling on Wednesday, these guys will be tying up, collar tying, pushing each other. They'll do it with gloves. They'll be doing strikes, all sorts of things in open, in, in open wrestling. But this is how they practice a nice drill where they can just practice these two components and get a lot of, a lot of, a lot of repetitions in just like this. Good guys. Good enough, that was great. Now you're gonna see a series of contest drills that we call limited skill sparring. And in these drills that are coming up now, now you have fighters actually trying to outthink each other and try to debunk each other's skills. And the fighters are limited to only a certain number of skills, that's all they can use, so that they perfect those, they perfect those skills in fast action sparring, and, and then pretty soon they become well-rounded by compartmentalizing all these skills by themselves. I'll explain it to them as we go along. 
Okay, every drill that you see is beneficial to a fighter no matter what level he's fighting at. But this is how we start with new fighters and we use it with our, with our combative system. Paul and I are gonna come out here, we're gonna spar, and all we're gonna be allowed to use is just jabs to the stomach first. This is fantastic for fighters who aren't fully conditioned yet for impact. On this next drill, uh, Paul's going to be limited to moving around the ring with nothing but a straight jab to my head. He can't do anything else. And I'm going to be limited to doing nothing but I can jab to his body offensively, and then all I can use is defense. I can't put anything in his eyes. So here we are. We're limited again, and we're going to try to survive with just those skills. Okay, this one will both be limited to jabs, straight jabs to the head only. That's it. And for this next drill, we're going to be limited to using our lead hand, but we can throw any kind of punch we want with that lead hand. We can throw jabs, uppercuts, double hooks, shovel hooks to the body, anything we want. But what you really want to see us doing all the time here to make sure the fight is developing correctly is making sure that right hand is, is back and it's set all the time. Because what we're really doing with our lead hand is setting up that right cross. And it's set up well from way back here where it's powerful. And of course, in combatives, we try to throw the right hand to the center of the body because it's a stationary target that our opponent can't move out of the way. Okay, this next one is basically the way we practice close quarters in fighting. We're going to fight from our knees. And now we can't use any lateral movement. We won't be able to slip, bob. We can't use our body as a coil. So basically we're limited to punching, blocking, smothering punches, and rolling with punches. It's all we can do here. There's nowhere to run.
Okay, this next drill is called close quarters body punching. We'll be starting shoulder to shoulder, starting the inside just like you saw in the last drill. We can stand, we can use hip rotation. This gets dangerous. You shouldn't do this unless you're already in shape or unless you have a good pair of rib protectors. Okay, in this next drill, Paul's gonna come out, full boxing, he's gonna throw whatever he wants. Mike knows it, obviously. Mike can't do anything except shoot, except take him down. Mike's whole objective here is to not get hit and take his fighter down. And of course, the best time to do that is when the guy's punches are already in flight and he's left vulnerable. Let's see if he can get him off, see if his timing is shot. And remember, the bigger they are, the harder they hit. And the bigger they are, the more sharp they can absorb. But you move your head well. True. Now we're going to demonstrate a series of preemptive strikes and tactics. These techniques are to be used when a person has already come into our social space. Everybody is responsible to understand self-defense in the law. We will not have time to go over those issues in this video. So for the purpose of this video, we'll, we'll say that we have already seen this person commit a serious violent act in our presence. He has now come into our social space and he is now threatening me with the same harm. He's within the reactionary gap, and I might not be able to react to an attack because he's too close. We try to follow seven general rules when we train in preemptive strikes. The first rule is how his eyes are my biggest enemy. If I throw anything towards his eyes, I may cause a reflexive trigger, which might make him move his head, which is the target, or bring his hands up reflexively to interfere with my strike. First rule is his eyes are my biggest enemy. Anytime we can avoid shooting towards the eyes, we try to do that. The second general rule, general rule, is never walk away from a fight you're already in. If the subject is this close to me, and now I decide to turn away from him, and I've walked away from a fight I'm already in, that might be the trigger for him both psychologically and physically to attack me because he knows he has, he has the advantage because he's cut an angle and he might see my turn as weakness and that might be a time where he throws the punch. So a general rule of thumb is never walk away from a fight you're already in. We take the shot. General rule of thumb number three. Anytime we get an opportunity to intercept an attack, we do so. If I strike at the moment that he enters my social space, I've used his, mo his momentum against him because he's walked into my power, he's increased my power, at least doubled it, and I've reduced his reaction time in half. 
It's sudden and it's unexpected. General rule number three, intercept an attack if possible. General rule number four, move as suddenly as possible with no pre-attack signs or physical stances. The exception to that is to disguise your attack by talking with your hands, even with your mouth, occupying his mind cognitively, so he's thinking about something else, as I'm bringing my hands, which are the weapons, closer to my target. No pre-attack signs or signals, no stances, no hands up, just from here or here. The setup that you just saw was designed during the cognitive stage to occupy his mind cognitively. And what you saw is you saw a non-threatening hand position that we call the who me. Who me? Non-threatening hand gesture. Who me? And I've actually loaded my hands. And now I can throw a whipping action, which is about the fastest strike a human being can actually throw, is that whipping action. And that may go across his eyes, or his neck, and then of course it will be followed up. The who me. The next general rule of thumb is to focus on the striker's triangle of the subject. We take a look at the relationship between the tip of his forehead to each shoulder, and you see a triangle. Once that subject has approached us, and I've already cleared his hands of weapons, and I saw that there were no weapons, and now I'm worried about an imminent attack, I need to watch that triangle or his collarbone going from shoulder to shoulder. This is the same thing that boxers do in the ring. If Warren was boxing with me, his hands might be too fast for me to see what he was going to do. But if he was going to throw a right hand, I would see the, the triangle warp because his shoulder moves. If he was going to throw the left hand, I could see the shoulder warp and I could move. If he, we were wrestling or we were in the street, it was an attack and he was going to tackle me. I could see the top of the triangle move. I saw his head. If he was going to throw a kick, I could see the triangle warp again. So we try to watch the striker's triangle, and we watch his hands with our peripheral vision. Striker's triangle is how we protect ourselves against an imminent attack if we're not able to preempt his attack. General rule number six. In this situation, you want to think of every human being as a human bomb, ready to explode in your face covering you with shrapnel. As soon as we get an opportunity to defuse that bomb, we do it. We don't wait for it to explode in our face. Rule number seven, we never make a closed fist in combatives. We never make a closed fist in combatives. If we make a closed fist, two things happen. Number one, when I make a fist, I get a curve in my wrist. This is where a lot of hand injuries come early on in boxing training. People make the fist, and then exposes their thumb and their wrist turns. What we do is, just like an experienced fighter does, he lays his fingers down. This is what a real experienced boxer does in the ring inside of a pair of boxing gloves that are pretty rigid. He doesn't make a fist. He doesn't squeeze those gloves and try to hold them together. He just lays his fingers down. All the demonstrations that you watch in this video before today were with our hands just laying our fingers down. When we do preemptive strikes, our hands may be open, and we lay our fingers down as we bring our fist to the target. So just for a second, Warren, I'm going to throw this shot so they can actually see my hand. I'll try to throw it at an angle. My fingers are laid down. Zoom in on that. There is no fist. There's no resistive tension. I don't want to slow down my speed. Everything is open. In combatives, we're constantly going from open hands to closed hands to open hands, especially in preemptive strikes. Preemptive strikes are done with a completely relaxed muscle, so it's incredibly fast. There's no chance to make a fist. We don't make fists. There are no fists in combatives. We just lay our fingers down.
For one second, I'd like to ask you as my viewer to think about somebody who you really hate. Just for a moment, think about that person right now. And what did you see? You probably saw his face. That's what we think of. When we hate someone, we think of their face. And when we're in a fight on the street, most people go for the face, the face that they hate, the one that they're angry at. That's what most people expect to get hit, in the face. People are always protecting their face, and combatants are always hitting each other in the face, all day long. In combatants, we try not to go to the face. Generally, we try to go to the body. Again, we don't want to activate reflexive responses and triggers from his eyes seeing the target, seeing the weapon coming at his target. So we try to go to the body because it's easy, it's stationary, it's hard for him to move, it's vulnerable, we can incapacitate for a long period of time, and most people don't know how to block it. So what you just saw there demonstrated was called the hammer drop. I tried to do it as much as I could without telegraphing towards one, and it came over in an arc, and hopefully it would have drew a response of him to bring his hands up. So his hands are going in the exact opposite direction that my weapon was going. So it looked like this. So as he was going to block the shot, I was going under the shot. So I came toward his eyes and towards his body. Again, there are no fists and combatives. So as he walks towards me, I go down, stay here one. I hit the target, and then I follow through with whatever we do. This technique is called the belly blast. All the techniques are going to have names that will help our students remember the procedure. You'll see as we go along. With the belly blast, again, I'm trying not to move the striker's triangle. So what I'm doing here is my fingers are coming up light, and they're reaching the elevation of the target, and only at that point do my knees drop forward to bring my weight forward and I accelerate with the strike into my target. Again, laying my fingers down. Fingers come up. If he's close to me, he may only be able to see down to my chest. The strike has already begun. If you want, you can videotape right here. Now I'll go to wide angle. Back. Now if you can videotape right here. My fingers slide up my body. My shoulders don't move. He's too close to see what's going on. As I reach the elevation of my target, my knees and my body accelerate and it's too late for him. And that's the belly blast. All of these techniques that you're going to see from the belly blast on are done with an explosive energy. It's explained much better in the internal acts. The best way I've ever heard it described is like a sneeze, just as if I sneezed through the muscles of my body. In those internal acts, they call it fajing, explosive energy. This technique is called the pocket blast. It's just like the belly blast, except for doing it with one fist. With the belly blast, we shot straight ahead with both fists directly in front of us. By the way, when you practice that technique, you don't want to limit yourself to practicing straight ahead all the time, as if someone's always going to be directly straight in front of you. In the real world, it never works out that way. They're always at an angle. So when you practice those techniques, you always practice at slight angles. Life just isn't perfect. Now with the pocket blast, it's just a single-handed blast, and now we're more at an angle of the pie. Rather than having someone directly in front of us, we're more at the angle. So now it's going to be a lot like the right cross that we throw in boxing. And again, we use the name the pocket blast to remind us that it's coming from the pocket. Using the same procedure that we use in the belly blast, our fingers are sliding up our clothes, we're not moving that striker's triangle, 
because he's the one that's getting sucker punched. And we want the hand flying. He doesn't see any move in my body until it's too late. And then once I reach the elevation of my target, the knee accelerates the rotation, just like in boxing. And we throw the shot. That's the pocket blast. One more time, Warren. Fingers laid down, nice and light. Relaxed muscles, explosive speed. This next technique is called the frog's tongue. That may have looked like just an open palm. It may have looked like a boxer's jab, which is more like a piston. But I call it the frog's tongue because we don't want him to throw a palm heel, a push. And we don't want him to throw a jab, a boxer's jab, which is a piston. I want him to throw it like a frog's tongue. Again, we want that whipping action. It's been measured as one of the fastest human strikes, that whipping action. I've loaded up, if you could want him to turn towards me, hands up, by actually taking all the tension in my hands and I'm loading like, loading, like a frog's tongue or a chameleon's tongue, a lizard, when you see it come up and it pops, it's so light. And it's exactly what happens on the street. He's grabbed me. But what he did is he let me breach his hands by grabbing me. Now how can he react reflexively? His hands are beyond that point. He can't act reflexively. He'll never catch up to a strike now. What a foolish move. For that matter, all we need is a right cross on his chin to finish this guy but we do what we call the frog's tongue. It's laid down, it's totally relaxed. I want to prevent myself from being punched. I'm already on top of his hands. This isn't the worst position in the world. And then again, I have a human bomb in front of me. He's already committing an assault. It's going to happen. So what we're going to do is, is with our muscles, with as much relaxation as possible, is we're going to explode. The knee generates the rotation and the arm moves, and I try to hit him on the jaw, twisting his head just like we talked about in the beginning of the video, the way we, we achieve a boxer's knockout is a rapid head spin. So I try to get his chin, and then what have I done? I put myself in, the, in my perfect boxing posture, my orthodox posture, I'm a right-hander, and then away we go with everything else we do. And that's just called a frog's tongue. Good for him for a second. Again, we usually start from the who me position, this time rather than who me. My hands are in my position, and then it's this. We try never to move our feet with a preemptive strike. If I had to move my feet, that means I was already out of arm's length. I probably could have moved back. Once he was, he's within my arm's length, come on in here, Warren, for a second. I don't ever need to move my feet. The feet move too slow for a preemptive strike. Way too slow. Anyone thinks they can do that in the real world, better practice a lot. We don't ever want to have to move our feet in a preemptive strike. Just that knee up in the hand. This next technique is called the spiral clap. We demonstrated that um, Warren had to take a hit. Uh, nobody should take an unnecessary shot to the head. The only time we do it is when we're spiraling. Uh, this was done for the purpose of this video. For that matter, nobody should do any spiraling or doing any head punching without professional supervision, and nobody should train in any club that lets their fighters fight while they're dehydrated. Anyone that boxes or does any full contact punching to the head should be completely hydrated. Professional boxing many years ago, about 80% of all ring deaths happened after the 12th round. And they determined it wasn't because of the accumulation of punches necessarily. It was because the fighter was dehydrated, he lacked cerebral spinal fluid, and now he had a dry brain inside a dry skull. So we don't hit each other like this often. We may do this demonstration to convince a student that it's effective. Many times we demonstrate this, we do this with a big attack helmet, and even with moderate strikes, people have ended up on the floor. 
because we're using the head spin, the rapid head spin that you can use, use in a knockout. It takes very little to knock somebody out with a rapid spin. It's not necessarily the power, although power gives a fast spin, it's the spin of the head. So what we actually did here, we'll do it nice and slow, is the attacker had me close to him in a position, again, he breached my hands, he put himself in a very vulnerable position. Rather than go through wrist locks and all these crazy techniques that have a failure rate, unless you're extremely experienced, I can just do the strike. I would take the strike. So what I did was, at the same time, I hit him with two hands at the same time. Again, the jaws would spin the heads in, head in boxing, and it's also going to happen here in combatives with preemptive strike. At the same time that I hit his jaw, I want to accelerate that spin, and I will use the same force on the opposite side of that sphere. I'm not using a spiral motion. I'm actually using two linear motions, his jaw and above his ear and the head. It's going to cause a spiral because of the way that his head is attached to his neck. So as I hit him, it causes a spiral. It's not going to go this way. It's going to cause a spiral. The neck is very strong back and forth, especially with these wrestler types like Warren. Pull him forward, don't move Warren. A lot of power in the neck. The neck's designed to go forward. The neck is also designed to stop himself from going back in angles. No resistance. But with a spiral, the muscles aren't, used, aren't designed to work that way, and it's very easy to cause a rapid spinning of the skull, and that's why you get a knockout, because the muscles aren't designed to do that. So again, his loose hands, it's like your hands were with the frog tongue. We're just, at the same time, again, good luck with reaction time. You, uh, my hands are way too close. And then I just, at the same time, I s hit his jaw, spin his head, warm buckle during the demonstration. So we should never play with these things unless we're real close and we're ready to catch our partner. It's going to be demonstrated once, basically just to give the person confidence that it, that it has an effect and never again, and then we're here for whatever happens. All preemptive strikes are also considered starting block techniques, which means we would love to end the fight with a preemptive strike, but we're ready for a war of attrition if it fails. Always ready. Every preemptive strike is also a starting block for us to turn up our game. This technique is called the finger flash. Again, Warren breached my position. He came in too close. We did that with an edge weapon. This type of thing could happen to anybody out on the street. Somebody's holding a knife with your throat, talking to you, they're telling you to move. Again, wrist locks have their place. But we always want to go with a technique that has a high rate of success and a low rate of failure. Wrist locks are fantastic for people who resist arrest. They're very difficult in self-defense situations. When we did that scenario with Warren, Warren had safety glasses on, shooting glasses, underneath a full headgear. And I went for the pad of the helmet, not his eyes. But what happens is, when we do this on the street, and we practice on one of our dummies that has a face, I'm giving myself eight shots. Again, I'm using basically the same technique we use in the frog's tongue with the loose hands. I might have held him for a second to stop the cut. If I had done that, maybe I would have taken the release of the hand and thrown the shot. But what we did is we instantly attacked with our eight fingers. I'm trying to throw all eight fingers directly towards the center of his eyes over the bridge of his nose. I have four fingers covering each eye. I'm giving myself eight shots at the apple. If I can get even just one eye and scrape across his pupils, then I can cause a sympathetic response. And the flash to his eyes will cause him to bring his hands back as he gets hit. And then give me the shot. And a technique like that with a follow-up is very quick. When I move my hands, Warren, just react like you would if something was in your eyes and bring your hands back. And then we'd be gone. Again, I don't want to do a lot of follow-ups in this video, but this is called the eight finger flash. Again, this is the same thing as that from a who me position. It doesn't have to be a weapon technique. Again, it's much more comprehensive what we do. But our hands are here. And we just flash directly towards the eyes. It's very simple. The hands just stay together. That's how we practice on the heavy bag. That's how we practice on the dummy with the face. We just explode. Comes across his face. 
Hopefully we catch an eye, and if we don't, we have our hands in front of us, we have him bring his hands back as a reflective trigger, and then we go down to the body again, probably. That's the finger flash. I want to thank everybody for purchasing this video program. You got a real comprehensive look at our combative system. I want to thank Warren Loans, who is the owner of the High Time Submission Fight Club. I want to say directly and thank you to all the athletes from his club that came up here and helped me every day put this program together. I hope we do some work again in the future. And I want to say to anybody that's in law enforcement, the military, or a civilian, if you're in a situation where you have to defend yourself, remember, there's nothing more important than a skilled pair of hands, and that's a fact.